Brothers and sisters, this evening I want to encourage you to give your best attention to the concluding ministry, the concluding instructive ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ, the night in which he was betrayed. I think many of us know the uh, wonderful truths in the Sermon on the Mount and the landmark sermon, the signature sermon, we might say, of Jesus Christ in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 as he began his public ministry. And I think one of the profoundest places in the New Testament is where Christ, the night of his betrayal, began to sum, sum up for his apostles many of the teachings that he had given in seed form and as they, as they flowered. And during his three to three and a half years of public ministry, and as he came to the end of his time of humiliation to be consummated the next day in the horrors of that terrible mock trial and the receiving of lashes and the horrors of the cross, that Jesus Christ thought it was important enough to take time that night before the night of his arrest, and discourse with the apostles these priceless teachings that sum up so well uh, his instructional ministry for the redeemed. And in particular, I want you to address with me in your own thinking and reflection the issue of bearing fruit. A bit of history. Around 1630, controversy began to develop in England and New England on the subject of good works and the proclamation of the gospel. I think most of you know that whenever there is a major change in society, be it for good or for ill, there's always some pushback and some reaction and some overreaction. And when Martin Luther rediscovered the truth of salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone and not of works. In time, there came to be some who took that to an excess, an, an excess, not success, but to, took it to an extreme. And in some and varying degrees taught that the pursuit of good works was wrong, or if not wrong, problematic, and was minimized and came to be called antinomianism under a general heading, we could say, which the word technically means against the law, antinomos, against the law of God. Although properly, that word has been, well, I say properly, uh, it's been used colloquially, more often to describe those who reject the idea that the pursuit of personal holiness is nece necessary and important. And we have the question of good works. Are good works, the bearing of fruit, a necessity or just nice to have? And there are some who would say that's great if you have good works, but it's not necessary because we're saved by grace through Christ. And that Jesus Christ is our sanctification, that in Jesus Christ we're sanctified and as far as pursuing holiness personally, that's not necessary. And yet if we turn to the cornerstone text of summing up the Reformation beginning in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, we need to remember that there's also verse 10. And I'll read that by way of refreshment of our memories. Ephesians 2, beginning with verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, 
It is the gift of God, not as a result of works that no one should boast. And I think that draws a very sharp line against any inward thought of meritorious working, of earning God's redemption or any aspect of it by our good works. But verse 10 follows, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. We're created for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In a sense, we can say that what we're considering this evening is one application of Christ's unqualified declaration of his preeminence, his exclusive and unique preeminence as the way. This is one of the elements of his way. This is one of the elements of his truth. This is one of the elements of eternal life as granted by Jesus Christ. So let's look at the analogy, if you will, or the figure of speech, the metaphor of the vine and the branches. I am the vine, the true vine. And in verse 4, he says, I am the vine. So he repeats that once with the qualifier, I am the true vine, at the beginning of this part of the discourse. It's one of the I am passages. We Remember we discussed this morning and considered the fact that passages in which Christ said I am focus especially on his essence. So we can say that this metaphor of a grapevine with branches that bear fruit is a metaphor that is profound in helping us understand the relationship we have with Jesus Christ. I believe that in this part of the state of California where we have grapevines, it should not be particularly difficult to convince people that there's an intimate connection between the vine, the vine that bears the branches and the fruit that the branches bear, and that the branches cannot exist apart from the vine. What a beautiful picture of the exclusive life-giving character of Jesus Christ himself. And then I think there's a tendency to somewhat overlook the second half of verse 1, in which he says, my father is the vine dresser. And especially because of what follows in the second half of verse 2. A vine dresser, by definition, description, is one who takes care of a grapevine. And it's good to remember that they didn't have pressure sprayers and tractors with uh, machinery to dispense uh, bug killers and other forms of, of agricultural spraying. That a vine dresser in the time at which Christ spoke and for centuries before and after would do the backbreaking work of going down a row of vines with a bucket of soapy water and washing every branch and every little emerging bunch of grapes to get rid of the mildew and the aphids, any other contaminant. And that's an amazing picture of God who tells us that he's numbered the hairs of our head. Of God who knows every word we speak in our mouth all, to, all together before we utter it. God who knows our down sitting and our uprising. And here Jesus Christ is saying that we in some remarkable senses, none, none, of, none, none of which I believe we fully can understand, God, our Heavenly Father, is intimately involved in making something happen to us who are the branches united to Jesus Christ, the vine. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Now that's interesting. And a remarkable picture of being on the covenant curse side of a covenant blessing when a person can be engaged in, 
engaged with Christ and in some sense connected to Christ, such that they are apparently a vine on the branch. And the uh, parable of the wheat and the tares illustrates much of the same thing, although I believe not nearly as clearly as this one illustration of the branch coming from the vine. But clearly, branches that are in some way connected to Christ or to his kingdom, to the church, if they are unfruitful are cut off and are taken away. And every branch that bears fruit, he washes it that it may bear more fruit. To put it another way, God scrubs us if we're his. If we are truly engrafted into Jesus Christ, God scrubs the impurities off through trial, through t testing, all his means of grace, the use of the outward means of grace, are all part of God's caring for us and changing us in spite of ourselves. So Christ could say we are his workmanship in the truest sense of the word. Paul could say that to the Ephesians. We're God's workmanship as God the Father is intimately involved in each of our lives and to some degree uniquely dealing with us in terms of personal variables that apply to no other person than each of us individually. God is intimately involved in that process. For me, with my small mind, I regard that as mind-boggling. That God the Father, maker of heaven and earth, is that intimately involved in our lives as professing believers in Jesus Christ. And then Jesus says, verse 3, to the apostles, the hearers, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you, which is a very tight and good summary of the fact that as we know the truth, the truth will set us free. The power of the gospel is contained in the word of God. The word of God is powerful, more sharper than any two-edged sword. And to the dividing asunder of the thoughts and intents of the heart, and so the word of God, which is proclaimed in various ways in the providence of God through the centuries, is the instrument by which, in a very real sense, Christ cleanses us, or if you will, the Heavenly Father, vine, vine dresser, cleanses us. So we are cleansed for a purpose. We are cleansed for the purpose of bearing fruit. And... There's a condition, a non-negotiable condition that's absolutely airtight. Verse 4, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. And that subject of abiding in Christ is rich. To abide in Christ it means to dwell in him, to take residence in him and he to take residence in us. And this is one of the ways that Jesus Christ unpacks the principle of our union with him once we are redeemed by the finished work applied to us, the finished work of Christ applied to us by the Spirit, and granting us belief in Jesus and repentance unto life. And so we have the idea of an intimacy that's profound. I have appreciated, by the way, greatly, the hospitality that's been extended to me by different members of this congregation when I've come up to preach. And one of the things that has always intrigued me, and it's nothing new or surprising, but it's intriguing, is how much more we get to know somebody or how much we can accelerate the process of getting to know each other when we stay even overnight at somebody's house. There's a visiting that goes on, a fellowship that goes on that's profound and we get a different insight into one another, hopefully more appreciative. But the fact is that abiding or dwelling with one another brings insight. How much more does abiding in Christ and knowing that Christ is abiding in us bring insight into what is the purpose of God is to glorify himself in us as we grow in grace, putting off sin, 
and putting on righteousness. So having re reminded the apostles a second time that he is the vine and that they are the branches, that he who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. That's a declaration. If we are abiding in Christ, Christ is abiding in us, we will be fruitful. That's a dogmatic declaration. It's not a pious suggestion. It's an affirmation from the mouth of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. Now I want to digress for a minute to 1 Corinthians 13, to a passage that I believe is sobering and one that can be easily misapplied, but I think in this discussion necessarily must be considered. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 10. According to the grace of God which was given to me, Paul here speaking to the Corinthian church, as a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building upon it. But let each man be careful how he builds upon it. Be careful how you invest your time and energy in building for the kingdom, we could say. For no one can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. So he's talking only about those who have their foundation in Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds upon the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each man's work, the idea of works now, this is not for meritorious benefit, but the good works that God intends, each man's work will become evident for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. Now, Paul is claiming that there are great differences in the quality of what we build between individual and individual, what we build on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And then there's an extreme end of a spectrum here that Paul reflects on. If any man's work in which he has built upon it remains, he shall receive a reward. And oh, how that has troubled the church because some equate that with meritorious receiving of salvation. And God rewards people not unto salvation, but commending them if they have served as faithful servants. And the parable of the three servants given the different sums of money well illustrates that. But here he says the obvious, that what we build on the foundation of Christ is going to be tested one way or another, tested by fire. And ultimately it will be shown that whether what we have invested in was durable or was ephemeral and passing. Verse 15, if any man's work is burned up, in other words, it proves to be worthless, doesn't survive the fires of trial and testing. If any man's work which he has built upon it remains, he shall receive a reward. But if any man's work is burned up, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved yet so as through fire. If I could put it with a modern idiom, he shall be saved by the skin of his teeth. And when you think about it, the integrity of God is lustrously reflected here because there, in a sense, is almost durably going to necessarily be, for God's integrity, some in heaven whose works are microscopic to validate the fact that there is salvation by grace alone through faith. This should not, however, be the norm, and I would trust that none of us would want to so live that when we reach the day of accountability, Christ says our works were worthless and we're saved by the skin of our teeth. 
So clearly there can be a great difference in fruitfulness. And at the beginning of the discourse, this idea of improving the fruitfulness is key as God purges us that we may bear more fruit. So abundance is an element of fruit bearing that's not inconsequential, but accountable. And so those that are truly in the vine are marked by fruit bearing, which God over time expects us to be increased. We're talking here about sanctification, fruit bearing, growing in grace, about putting off sin and putting on righteousness. Now when you think about washing, you think about cleansing, there's an element of that that's easy to overlook when we emphasize fruit bearing specifically. That that's so central, it's easy to forget what we are washed from. And there's a very real sense in which we will not well appreciate the incredible gift of Christ, the sacrifice he made, the degree of love that he exhibited going even to the cross for us if we do not have a careful understanding of what it is we're saved from. Every time you use the word gospel, which literally means good news, there's the implication that there's bad news. And the bad news is that even our righteousnesses after we're redeemed are like menstruous rags. And before we're saved, we are indescribably vile in the eyes of Almighty God. We have not only the sin of Adam signed to us by our descent from our first father, Adam, but the iniquities that we ourselves have committed without number over time, which were repulsive, extremely repulsive, odious to Jesus, to Jesus Christ as he bore the penalty of those sins and the curse of those sins on the cross. So the branches that are united to Christ in truth are going to be in some conspicuous way willing to embrace the means that God has ordained through his workmanship to grow. So what is the importance of bearing fruit? Well, I started out by talking about antinomianisms, or people that have tried to keep a low emphasis on fruit bearing out of fear that that would be incrementally transmogrified, trans-chipped over into works righteousness. That God has not given the perp, the, the calling for good works, he has not given that only as a nice to have. He's first of all given it as a commandment, has he not? He is here clearly indicating this is his divine will to bear fruit. Verses four through six. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. So what are some of the other reasons that God wants us to bear fruit? Not simply in some weak and generic sense to glorify him, but first of all to obey him. And it's in, not inconsequential or happenstance then at the end of the discussion of fruit bearing, Christ says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. And he previously had said in 1415, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So that there's a very clear tie there between godly living and our love for Christ or lack thereof. But it's an evidence of being saved, an evidence of salvation is bearing of fruit. And it's an evidence of abiding in Christ. Look at verse 8. By this is my Father glorified that you may bear much fruit, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. God is glorified as we bear fruit on his terms in Christ's way. 
does that matter? Do you care? Do I care about glorifying God in the pursuit of holiness? And please God, we should be able to say without mental reservation, yea and amen, please God, that never ceases to be in the forefront of our minds. Look at verses 4 and 6. I won't read them again. But we can say that out of that comes another reason why this is important. It distinguishes true and false believers, which is a theme Christ raised again and again, ultimately distinguishing between those that are genuinely redeemed and those who are only apparently redeemed. Colossians chapter 3. Let's go there for a moment. We've been there before. Colossians 3 gives us another insight into this matter of bearing fruit. Including verse 15 this time. Let the peace of Christ, which is in of Christ, rule in your hearts. To have a peaceful heart one is at peace in a world of turmoil. Is that a fruit of the Spirit? To have the peace of Christ, is that a godly, spiritual fruit? Of course, we could say amen. amen. To which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell in you with all wisdom. Is that a fruit of the Spirit, where the Word dwells in us effectually and richly? And of course we can say, Amen, praise God, yes. Teaching and admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Is the interaction of congregational members with each other, and particularly in the presence of God as we contribute to worship, is that a means that God uses to stimulate us to love and good works? Is that a means that God uses to stimulate us to be encouraged? And of course we know the answer. And in Ephesians chapter 4, 15 and 16, where Christ tells the Ephesians to speak the truth in love to one another, that's clearly identified as a means by which each member of the body grows in being built up together in a holy structure. That's a tremendously important text. And then. Whatever you do, do all in, the, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Identifying clearly our conspicuous and conscious desire to do what we do as unto Christ or in his name, is that a fruit of the Spirit? And again, I think we can respond emphatically, amen. Notice with each of these in this passage in Colossians 3, 15, 16, and 17, each one brings up the context or the attitude of thanksgiving. Verse 15 ends with, and be thankful. And then verse 16 ends with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Verse 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. So the giving of thanks is an element in the bearing of fruit. But there's even more. Verse 7 of our text. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, and obviously then you'll be fruitful, ask whatever you wish and it shall be done for you. I propose that it could be the subject of an entire sermon to just talk about the abundance of Christ to his people. That's an astounding declaration. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, it shall be done for you. Now we obviously say, and properly so, that if we ask something according, that's not according to the word, we should rightly, if we're walking with Christ, understand it'll be refused. But here the presumption is that what we ask, we're asking according to the word and will of God. And so Jesus Christ has committed us, or has committed himself, to answering prayer in a way that is beyond our full understanding. But there's still other reasons for the bearing of good works. First Peter chapter two. First 
beginning with verse 13. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and praise of those who do right. Would you be willing to concede briefly that this is an exhortation as Christians to have at least some awareness of what's going on in the world and having some obligation to address it both in terms of responding insofar as scripture allows to the authority of the, those that are placed over us and of course obviously to pray for them. But look at verse 15 that follows the context of verses 13 and 14. For such is the will of God that by doing right, bearing fruit, doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Astounding. God uses the weak things of the kingdom to confound the supposedly strong things of the world that the godly behavior of Christians is designed and ordained by God to have as a purpose the silencing of ungodly ignorance by ungodly people. Our good works have that potential if they are indeed brought about according to God's word. And then I've already mentioned that the bearing of fruit particularly the fruit of truthfulness, speaking the truth in love contributes to the growth of the church. And that's not the only reason it's important. It provides an example for other believers. We need examples. Here are the words of Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. For our gospel, verse 5, did not come to you in word only, but also in power and the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. Verse 6. You also became imitators of us and of the Lord having received the word in much tribulation with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you, you Thessalonians, became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. Clearly, there's a place for godly example in the building of the church. That's another important reason why the bearing of fruit is important. And then, if you will, back to our text. Look at verse 11. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Now, today, as often happens, we've discussed this morning um, in some various ways where the world is going and the problems that are occurring. And it's easy to lose sight of the fact that we're called to be joyful. In the midst of adversity, we're called to be joyful. And if that comes to mind, the Hebrews 12 passage, that Christ, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. He is our divine and perfect example of joy in the, midst, in the midst of adversity and trial. But God wants his people to be joyful in Jesus Christ. And Christ said, I've told these things to you, I've spoken them, so that my joy, not just any joy, but the joy that Jesus Christ himself experienced, even in the going to the cross, may be in you. I've spoken to you about bearing fruit for that reason as well. And then I submit <coughs> that the bearing of fruit rightly understood is an implied encouragement to use the means of grace with diligence. Of course, that centers in public worship. So now I want to address a few applicatory thoughts. 
And will you turn, first of all, to the back of your hymnals to page 857. 857. This is to chapter 16 of the Confession of Faith. Chapter 16, paragraph 2, great section on good works. These good works, paragraph 2 now, page 857, these good works done in obedience to God's commandments, so there's that issue of submission now, are the fruits and evidences of a true and lively faith. And by them, believers manifest their thankfulness, strengthen their assurance, edify their brethren, we've addressed these, adorn the profession of the gospel, stop the mouth of the adversaries, and glorify God whose workmanship they are created in Christ Jesus thereunto, that having their fruit unto holiness, they may have the end, eternal life. Are good works necessary? Yes. Are they important? Yes. That we have to be careful how we describe it. Bearing of fruit, sanctification, is not a cause of justification. Not a cause, mind you but a necessary follow-on of justification. It inseparably follows justification. The primary basis of assurance, which chapter 16, 2 spoke, spoke to, is in the promises fulfilled in Christ and his works. There is the primary basis of, of assurance of salvation. However, in Christ, Objective promises and subjective experience are complementary, not antithetical. They complement each other. Our walk with Christ complements our faith in the promises of Christ. They are mutually agreeable and complementary. Even Christ himself received reassurance of the Father's love in the context of his obedience. Look at verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. That's a remarkable declaration in its own right that Jesus Christ himself indicated that he is an example of finding assurance in obedience. So Christ stressed three things here in this passage as particular fruits. One was obedience, one is love for another, one another, and one is joy in him. Now there's many others that we could consider. But in the end, when all is said and done, we need to come back to square one and remember that apart from Christ and apart from abiding, abiding in him, apart from keeping our union with him burnished and well-maintained like a well-trimmed lamp is inseparably important from bearing fruit. So there's no third category. There's fruit bearers and non-fruit bearers. And we are called, I believe, to embrace the idea that without sanctification, no man shall see the Lord. Let's pray. Help us, Lord Jesus, to understand with great care humility of heart, humility of mind and attitude, the distinctions that you make in your holy word. And we pray that we will never seek to step aside from our obligation to bear much fruit for you and for the Father and the Father's glory out of a misapplication of the great and marvelous truth that we're saved by grace through faith and not by works. 
Help us to treasure this call as that which is a high and holy marking out of believers from the world. And may we be humbly willing to ever zealously acknowledge that whatever good work is found in us, whatever quality of grace, we give you, Lord Jesus, all of the praise and the honor and the glory. And all of this we plead in Christ's precious name. Amen.